Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables. You know Zach. He's been on the show before. Zach is the man who has turned his mind to making tomahawks and other more traditional weapons, EDCable weapons and EDCable tools. Uh, he's had a wide variety of implements. Uh, sometimes I call them implements of chaos uh, come out through his uh, through his uh, company, Wingard Wearables, uh, most notably uh, three tomahawks. Uh, you've got variations of those tomahawks, uh, a, an actual pylon that you can wear and use. And uh, coming up here soon, he might have something uh, that we're all going to be very excited about, even more so than tomahawks. We'll talk to Zach and find out all about what he's got cooking. Uh, but before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video. You can also head on over to Patreon, where you can help support the show. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Zach, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you here, sir. Always great to be with you, Bob. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's it's always great to have you here. Um, you know, I, I like to say I started the show because uh, no one in my midst, no one around me wants to hear me go on and on about knives. And um, I, I, I don't know, I think maybe you started your company for maybe similar reasons, but um, you've got a great YouTube channel that every time you put a video on, I am one of those 12 people who watches to the end. Awesome. I, I love them and I love your historical take. So anyway, it's great to have you back. Um, so a new product, it's new ish that uh, you've been going to town on recently uh, is one that uh, is an upgrade or an upsize to something that you've already had out. And I see it in your hand right there. And yeah, this is the, yeah, is this? this is the original dick pick multi-tool. So we came out with the dick pick in like 2021. So it's an L-shaped spike. You got a hammer face on one side, pry bar on the other, and then this uh, spike on the other end. It's kind of shaped like, uh, you know, if you're listening to the show, it looks like, wouldn't you say Grim Reaper scythe kind of? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. it looks a lot like a scythe. Yeah, and so it is a uh, spike tool, pry bar, percussive hammer tool. You can grip it in a variety of ways, like a push dagger or an ice pick grip, that sort of thing, for um, utility and defensive use. And so when we came out with uh, the full-size dick pick, it's about six and a half inches long. Um, a few people were like, hey, you know, can you make a smaller one? Uh, and so we said, yeah. And so we made a smaller version. And the reason we call them the dick pick is you can't wear them above your groin, you know, tucked inside the waistband. But we came out with the micro dick pick. Okay. So it's about four and a half inches long. It's thinner um, stock material, but it's still a spike. And it's a little bit harder, uh, steel harder hardness, more tapered, and really good for uh, like all like task and scribing. But while we made it, of course, you know, got to exploit that design space, you know, fully explore and uh, see how much utility and, and combative use you can get out of it. And we were thinking, hey, got to make that dick pic magnum. And when he had me on the show, I think it was back like November, December, we mentioned we're thinking about it. We didn't know what it looked like or how big it was going to get. And it's huge. This is what it looks like in the scabbard. But it is uh, 12, just over 12 inches long. Wow. Um, and we went with this really cool hand-forged twisted grip section. It's, it's kind of traditional, like, uh, medieval dagger twist. So you got right. you know, gripping grooves. But it also transitions the cross-section. Instead of, like, square cross-section like our previous dick pics, it ends in a, a diamond cross-section. And so, um, yeah, this thing's really cool. And actually, even though it looks large and uh, it's in the scabbard, it weighs less than a K-bar knife in a sheet. Hmm. And so, um, and the scabbard's slim enough to slide through Molly Pal's loops, you know, if you are wearing it and you're here. But we put on these little grommets on here, little brass eyelets, and I put on a discrete carry concepts clip. And I've actually been wearing mine 
above my groin. So you got to stick the, you know, the 12 inches of, uh, you know, scabbard down your leg, like right. just offset from the uh, wedding tackle. You know, you can't just have it directly on the wedding tackle. <laughs> but, gotcha. you know, traditional uh, medieval daggers, like they call them bullock daggers. Oh, really? You know, those had, uh, well, I'm going to try to use G-rated language. Uh, they were, you know, people in medieval times had sense of humor similar to many people today. And so they wanted a dagger that kind of looked like male genitalia. It had a, and they actually would wear it uh, above their groin. You would see depictions of knights and stuff wearing a dagger just hung in the center, handle pointed up. It was a little bit of crude humor, but because daggers were a means of self-defense back then, they wanted to be able to reach to their core with either hand and draw the dagger and use it to either deflect a defensive blow or, you know, stab an enemy. Uh, so those were bollock daggers. And here we got the dick pic, now magnum size. <laughs> magnum. It, is, it is truly medieval dagger size. Like uh, they, I've been in museums, like war museums in France, where they had uh, rondel daggers and bollock mm -hmm. daggers that were this short. Now I know they definitely had ones that were even longer, so you could do like block a sword with your forearm, you know, sort of thing. But you know, soldiers back then were, were pretty practical, too. And you, if you could get away with carrying something shorter that would get the job done, you would do it. Um, and so we think uh, about 12 inches is probably pushing the maximum practical length that, like, uh, say, a soldier would carry. But it also works inside the pants. Now, you know, your pant tightness and pant color and stuff, it could print more. Like if you wear denim jeans you know, denim will wear, like, uh, it'll show hot spots. Yes, yes. You, if you were wearing this every day with denim, I mean, you'd, you'd start get getting a lot of you attention. Would, yeah, yeah there ladies and some men would be paying attention to you. So, you know, you definitely need to choose, like, with all wearable items, whether it's our tomahawk spikes, quills, or just anything, like pocket knives with clips on them. Yep. There are clothing uh, types that have poor combinations with anything. So you always got to like choose the right combination, both in color and in fabric material. But yeah, we're excited. Dick Pick Magnus. And we launched these and within 25 hours, I wish I could say 24, but I'm a truthful <laughs> person. They sold out. So wow. That's great. That's, that's impressive. So, so this I know is designed to be the length of a K-bar. Um, it's it's a it's uh, a, you know supposed to stay in about the same length envelope of something like that, and then it's got no edges. Um, what are the benefits? Uh, speaking of this as a weapon first, uh, because that's that's what I see. Um, what okay, are the benefits so, of not having an edge? Um, so I got into this on my YouTube video about it. And it's yeah, a bit. Yep graphic but i'll i'll spare the war stories but i, I interviewed with a couple of veterans that um had to use blades in combatives in modern war we're talking within you know global war on terror uh mm -hmm. time frame and so um you know what they found was these single edged knives that were kind of big bellied like k-bar type knives or field knives or cold steel srk is another classic example um, very good utility knives, very good in combatives facing opponents that usually aren't wearing a lot of clothes on them. Um, but in two instances, they had difficulty, the soldiers did, incapacitating the target with a big bellied single edged knife. Now, a double edged knife, like twice the edge and very pointy, would have worked. Right. Especially if it was narrower, but they had issues getting through like layered nylon, think like a harness gear, like webbing. So you, the, yeah. the opponent isn't wearing any body armor, but they're wearing equipment on them that's connected on their body with layered nylon. Layered mil spec nylon is very resistant to like a single edge, like big belly knife, that point getting through. Um, and even opponents that were just in a cotton T-shirt and the blade on a K-bar or SRK is wide enough that if your orientation isn't right, uh, it's going to get jammed up on the ribs, like the rib cage. Mm -hmm. like the intercoastal spaces are actually very narrow and um, variable and angled like the, mm -hmm. in the rib cage structure. And you can't really, like you may have read like about the old school, like 
Sykes Fair Van Dagger, like, oh, you, you know, you keep your thumb orientation so the blade was horizontal to slip through the ribs. And it's like, well, if you look at a, a skeleton model, you know, and you bend it and stuff, those intercostal spaces are just, they're angled and they're going constantly all, changing. Exactly. So, um, with a dick pick magnum from a combative standpoint, um, you know, if you were facing an opponent that wasn't, you know, wearing body armor, just getting through reaching the vitals, it's narrow. You know, it's about a half inch wide uh, at the diamond cross section at its widest point, but it's from three eighths thick, uh, 1075, and it's pointy. You, you do need, a, you know, a sharp somewhere for the puncture to work. Right. And so it is going to efficiently split through and not be sensitive to orientation. Um, and it will be able to reach areas like if you went through the face and that sort of thing, which medieval daggers did. Eventually medieval daggers uh, evolved into not terribly good cutting instruments. They became sort of like sharpened uh, rods or bars. Mm -hmm. And that was because they had to like work in the gaps when they were facing opponents in body armor. You know, think isolates or the joints in, in plate armor and then ram at home. They weren't trying to stab through the plate armor. They were trying to work in the gaps. And when you start looking at, you know, soldiers in today's combat zones, although hand-to-hand -hand combat is rare, it does happen. Uh, once they're wearing um, ballistic body armor on their chest, um, it even covers up to the side of the neck. So the classic World War II sentry removal stuff, um, once they're wearing their Kevlar helmet and their plate carrier and, and uh, you know, the Kevlar all over their torso, you're working with gaps again. And the gaps may be larger than, you know, say at night wearing like medieval chain mail and plate armor, but there's still gaps. And a lot of those combative techniques that were proven in World War II using K-bar style knives kind of go out the window when you're talking about an opponent that's wearing ceramic plate, Kevlar, and then lots of magazines and stuff across their chest. Like you're not yeah. going to be able yeah. to, to stab through it. Even with a dick pick magnet, it's not going to get through a ceramic plate. You're not going to find the gap and, and take the long way around, like gaps between the collar and the, the neck, gaps on the shoulder straps, gaps under the arm, or gaps you know in the face, the opening and the helmet. Those are at, at minimum, you're talking seven inches or more to reach the vitals. And it's like, well, you can't do that with most fixed blades that are too wide to get through there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it's reminding me of uh, the Japanese armor that I've seen, you know, at the at the Met Museum that when you look at it, it's all laces and fabric and small, you know, small plates. It's not as overtly armor like like mm -hmm. medieval West uh, medieval European armor. But you know that that stuff was built with a purpose, not only absolutely beautiful to look at, but it could stop any manner of weapons. And it's kind of <clears throat> similar to just having layered cotton and then nylon mm -hmm. and then some sort of a jacket and all that. You know, unless you have something that's really acute or really hooked and, and, and yeah, like rippy. A you know, mm -hmm. like a karambit or a hawkbill of some sort, something serrated or something, you're going to have a lot of a hard time getting through that. Um, so talking about the dick pick and talking about the picks in general and the, and the magnum, you know, I have, I have this, this is the quill. Oh, and I like that wrap. Oh yeah. That's a little jute, there. jute wrap around there. I, I like love that. jute. Um, so this, this is another uh, thing that you make. You make this in a number of sizes and it started uh, it started as a design that your wife created, something that she could put around and keep like a jewelry. But mm -hmm. it's a, a really effective weapon. Obviously, it's got a lot of this is my favorite hold, the hammer mm -hmm. fist, but it's got a lot of uh, really great ways you can hold it. Uh, but it's also revealed itself as an incredibly useful tool for a lot of other things. We've talked about that on this show, staple remover, uh, uh, coffee cup carburetor, um, you know, all sorts of, all, like, oh, you, yeah. can you can tell what a, what a, what a easy lifestyle I lead, but you know, <laughs> lots of things you can use this for. What, where, do, where does the pick come in? What do you use the pick for? That's not okay. weapony. So, so I'll take the, I'll tell you this. Um, so even though we go wearable star with tomahawks, like 
it takes a special kind of person to to buy to own and carry a tomahawk on them every day. Yes, it like does. I think everyone should have a tomahawk. But it's like I, I know, like okay, most people are gonna think that's like too far for them, right? Um, but as far as spikes go, whether it's a, a very point sharp tip spike like the dick pick or a more blunt tip spike like the quill, everyone should be carrying a spike and a blade of some kind. I don't care if it's a folding knife with a spike or a sheet, a fixed blade, just the spike and the blade pair together so well. Um, you know, they need to be very light, very easy to carry, especially spikes, and they can be if they're designed right, but they're essentially like super fingers. If you look at the fingers you use every day, you use your nails to scrape things, you use your fingers to like, uh, you know, percussively, your knuckles to press into things, you use them to poke, you use them to tear things apart. And a metal spike, if it's done right, hmm. especially if it's like faceted, it's not just round, um, you can do all the tasks you can do with your fingers now greatly expanded because now it's, you know, thinner, stronger. It doesn't have nerves in it to feel pain. You can pry, you can pick, you can bash, you can tear things. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of tasks that normally would damage a folding knife or could damage a fixed blade. If you really mm -hmm. have a nice slicey fixed blade edge, um, you know, you don't want to be prying and scraping things necessarily with it or, you know, uh, piercing and twisting, you know, so you can do those types of motions with either the quill or the dick picks, but our dick picks are a harder steel and hmm. pointier. And so they do come with a carry system to protect you from the, the tip. And because they're longer than the, the quills, especially when you start talking about like the full size dick pick, and of course the Magnum, Magnum. Uh, you get, you get all kinds of pry hmm. and you know, the quills you can pry with, but for that hook like shape, that pry shape, it's, it's a lot like uh, it's things like, Hey, I pulled out a Tupperware dish, it's been in the freezer for two years. What the yes. hell is in this thing? So I can get that quill, you know, and, and pry it open like that. But, you know, you can take all kinds of prying angles with the dick pick magnum uh, or the dick picks. You know, yeah. it's that sort of simple L-shaped spike, you know, that can, you know, we scaled it up and down in size that can handle just a variety of things. But I mean, even like regular spikes, quills, either one of these, you can percussively bash things instead of using the the hammer fist the meat of your palm to hit mm -hmm. things you know you can do just all kinds of stuff with a properly designed spike um, uh, the spike the the dick pick to me seems like it would be great on a work site uh maybe even more than the quill i love the quill and it is a, a jack of every tray you can do anything with this but just in looking at at the uh at the at the dick pick right there you could also open a can of paint with that which you cannot oh, yeah. do with this i've tried yeah we've right. had customers lift uh floor tiles doing floor oh, stall installation nice. um <laughs> you know marking especially marking holes for drilling and stuff like that you know like doing scribing type motions right. for measurements um, right it, it's pretty amazing what our customers have come back to us with and, and you know that's just one of those things like if you're the designer and you're thinking like oh i'm gonna come up with this thing that's gonna be a weapon well, weapons are really really niche you know yeah. um it, it's fortunate that it's rare to need a weapon but it needs to be capable of a lot of adjacent possibilities and with both our quills and our, our dick pics no matter the size they have that and a spike is just basically like a super finger it's it's could be as at least as long as your finger and it's thinner and it's stronger and it's harder and it can be used to do all those things you're doing with your fingers every day like scraping and poking and, and piercing and tearing only better and so, it pairs well with a knife right oh yeah so uh, let me see the first let's see the carry for the regular uh regular dick pick the uh, the kydex carry and then show us the magnum and what you went through uh, <laughs> to, to come up with the carry system for the magnum all right so this is uh the dick pick carry system so uh it consists of a taco style sheath and you can fit the dick pick in in either orientation and it's got four eyelets on top and two on the bottom and it's got sort of a hook like feature too so if you wear this inside the pocket it kind of catches as you draw it but it's also got these shock cord tethers 
to strong alligator clamps so you can clip the clothing. So it's intended to be worn like tucked into your pants above your groin with, with this above the belt, you can just easily mm -hmm. access it. But you can wear a pocket carry. And if you don't like the elastic and the uh, strong alligator clamps, you can just cut that off, throw it away and get an aftermarket carry system like mm -hmm. uh, Ulti Clip or Discrete Carry Concepts Clips and put that hardware on there. We've made sure the uh, eyelet gaps were uh, spaced like that. And the micro dick pic is the exact same concept, just scale down, right? It's smaller, like fewer eyelets, shorter size, right? And these are great. Like Hydex is a fantastic material for uh, civilian context. Mm -hmm. um, and I have learned to like or tolerate working with Kydex. I used to hate it, but it's like you got it in the toaster oven at like 300 to 400 degrees. You got this big wide temperature range where Kydex gets soft and you, you can take it out. And as soon as you take it out of the oven and set it around the part, the mold and put it in the press, I mean, it is dropping temperature super fast, right? Um, but it's still malleable, right? It's got this huge range of temperatures where it's nice and malleable. Yeah. But, um, you know, when we started down the road for the Dick Pick Magnum, it was like, hey, you know, this is kind of, it's for civilians, first responders, that sort of thing. But it's also, you know, we want, if a soldier feels like they need such a thing to take into the battle, they, they can buy it, you know, and use it. And I reached out to a point of contact friend of mine who works in soldier equipping and that sort of thing. And he's like, hey, you can't use Kydex. Or elastics because of the temperature extremes because the u.s military or any military has to be able to fight in a huge range of combat environments mm -hmm. from uh i think they do most of their testing of most anything at negative 65 degrees fahrenheit wow. uh, and then they go all the way up to like 140 degrees fahrenheit <laughs> and so if you look at that temperature range there's not many uh plastics that do well and especially kydex uh, at temperatures at around, I think, a negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, when you subject your Kydex sheet to load, it will brittle, fracture, fail. It won't have, like right now, I can do some light bending, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm bending it here. You can barely see it, but it's got flex in it. Well, that flex goes away because the colder it gets, the harder and more brittle it gets. And Kydex is very similar to, like, PVC. And PVC has all kinds of problems at cold temperature. And people might think negative 65 degrees, that's never going to happen. Well, it has actually uh, in the Korean War, I'm going to mispronounce it. I think it was a, uh, I'm trying to remember the reservoir that they had a, a big battle in. It was down at negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and soldiers, you know, aren't like for us, we can wear. Even if we're walking around outside and it's like negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit, you're bundled up, you're wearing layers, and guess where your Kydex equipment is? It's up against your body under those layers. Yeah, it's yeah. harder to access, but you can still access it, and it's kept warm. It's, you know, you're outside in that environment at that temperature, but the Kydex isn't because you're wearing it close to your body. Well, a soldier could be wearing this on their pack or outside on their plate carrier could be exposed to the elements and if there's like sudden incoming artillery or other reasons they may have to hit the dirt land on a rock you know and then the kydex shatters so what we did is um you know we were like well what are what are you guys using for sheaths and holsters and stuff if it's not kydex this shows how little we knew about it right mm. and uh you know the reply back was layered textiles and also uh polyethylene and polyethylene uh, is common in many aspects. But one of the things that we were able to source was polyethylene tube, which fit the dick pick magnum and was used in irrigation. And irrigation has to be used, irrigation tube, across huge temperature ranges. Like you got, you know, you could have a record cold front temperature out in the Midwest in some farming community that could go, you know, well below 20 degrees uh, below zero. And the irrigation tubing's got to hold up. And so uh, we found uh, irrigation tubing that fit very well as a stiffener element. And then we surrounded it in textile, mil-spec nylon. And that required uh, investing in an 
industrial sewing machine that was very mm. expensive. <laughs> um, but it, I think that will be a good capability for the business because, yeah, we did invest in that for the Dick Big Magnum <laughs> scabbards, but I think we're going to be able to do a lot more stuff with that sewing machine. Oh, yeah, especially if you aim to make, you know, more and more implements uh, as time goes on That's that are military or first responder uh, mm -hmm. relevant. Like I, I, uh, I have a friend who used to be a firefighter, and when I was making knives uh, in my shed a little more than I have been um, the past couple of years, I was trying to design him a knife, and I had no idea how to, you know, I knew how how low the temperatures were just to cook the kydex and get it ready. I, I had no idea what sheath to make for him. And then the whole project fell apart anyway, but, but it, it occurred to me, can't be kydex. It'll, it'll soften up before you even walk through the door. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. And, and polyethylene may do that too. Cause I mean, um, everything's got melt temperature, but I mean, uh, you know, someone was telling me the other day, you mentioned your friend who was, used to be a firefighter. I think there was someone making knife sheaths out of old fire hose. Uh, it was interesting. So that's like one of those things where textiles, if they're fire resistant, heat resistant, and, and you know, cool resistant, you know, they're going to do better than leather and potentially Kydex, but it's just that's a learning curve for us. So we're able to get away with it with the Dick Pick Magnum because the Dick Pick Magnum is a fairly simple shape. It's like a uniform thinness to the point where we could just get a tube. We could source a commercial off-the-shelf tube to act as the stiff core of this and then sew around it. Uh, a knife is going to be trickier. I've got ideas for it, but uh, a knife, you know, across those temperature ranges, ooh, that's going to be tricky because um, the knife shape is so much more complex. A knife could be of any shape. Yeah. It's probably not going to be in a tube, you know. Yeah. So. Well, the, the Filipinos used to use wood. Maybe, maybe we'll we'll circle all the way back. <laughs> wood will burn a fire. <laughs> no, oh yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's I hadn't thought about that. You know, a, knife, a, a fire a firefighter's uh, knife scabbard. That's an interesting idea. So it, it with with all of the things you make, um, I have oh I have just a few of them right here. You have an interesting process. Um, uh, you know, just looking at at the dick pick magnum scabbard and knowing that um you um sourced and and your wife does a, a good bit of this work with you too she did the right? sewing yeah she okay the, so this is this is a this is a whole other just like with with every new thing you design you you're learning a new skill set I, I know that with the tomahawks and i'm thinking especially of the stingray and you you put up a cool uh, video the other day maybe just yesterday of you setting the mm -hmm. head on the uh, shaft, which is not just a plop it on there and pound it on. You're, you're making sure that the grooves and the, and the long um, sort of uh, flanges that are inside yep. to grip that you're making sure it's all lined up and you're pounding it on both sides. And it's a, it's a meticulous process. And then you're also um, learning how to shape. And uh, I tried throwing it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> learn, That's okay. yeah learning how to shape and um you know and work these woods every it seems like every new project you learn a new skill yeah um is is would you say that that's accurate and and working on these these magnums has it been more than just the sheath uh yeah i mean i i would say we always uh strive to like apply new things that we learn to a new product and also be willing to learn new things um with the Magnum, it, we hadn't done anything with 1075 steel before. And so with the blacksmith that we're working with, you know, there was a bit of a learning curve on, uh, you know, making that twist so that it would be a predictable, even though it was done by hand, a predictable angle. And we had to change the water jet cutting uh, part that we originated with um, to make that process easier of like doing the twist. So, I mean, there's all sorts of little subtle things that you learn about that you don't really think about going in. Um, but if it is like a whole new skill set, like for instance, the scabbard and an industrial sewing machine, that sort of thing, then, you know, the Dick Pick Magnum, which may wind up being a very niche product, right? It's, it's rather big Dick Pick. Um, you know, it may wind up enabling future product lines because of what we learn from it. You know, it's like each product that you, you go through the development process on, you kind of get more powerful. Uh, even if you learn things that didn't work, right, that still those memories are in your mind so that when you adopt a new product, 
you get more powerful. You know what I mean? Um, It's sort of like a brain power, experience power type thing. Um, But yeah, it's fascinating uh, to see it, you know, and I'm just, I'm excited about the future. But the Dick Big Magnum is today, uh, (laughs) unfortunately. Um, But we are going to get, uh, well, fortunately, I guess, but uh, we are going to, like, we didn't make, I think we made about two dozen of them because it was like, how many of these are we going to sell? I don't know. We don't yeah. do our own market research. Does two dozen of uh, you know twelve inch long dick pics sound like a lot to you? I don't know. It sounded like a lot to us because it was expensive. Uh, these are the most expensive wire jet parts we ever had made. Um, but you know, seeing them sell out in twenty five hours, we're just so thankful for our customers. But it's encouraging. It's like, all right, we're going to invest in a second batch, was- and it's going to be bigger, and we're going to see how it goes. That was that was uh, one per hour with a with a rest period in there for lunch or something yeah, very, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Exactly. Oh yeah. So I want mean, to I want to I wanna move on because we have something also exciting to talk about. But before we do, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, every time you hold up the Magnum to me, uh, it reminds me of a piece of World War II kit, just because of the way the sheath looks, even with I the love grommets. The sheath. I and, love the uh, shape. Yeah, and that mill spec nylon. Mm. I I kind of hate the look of Kydex. Kydex is wonderful, but when I look at like this sheath, yeah, you know, versus <laughs> Kydex, it just this just feels better to me by the eye and in the hand. Yeah. Like Kydex is is, uh, and I do the Kydex sheaths by hand, freehand. That's all me, and I'm covered in like black dust and stuff. Oh man, um, but. Like they work, they work really well, but yeah, this just, it feels like, yeah, World War Two. like, yeah, you know, it's got that. and it took a lot longer to make them like when the Kydex, so that's just okay. one of the things, you know, and it's not just us learning it, but it was like, you know, it, it took a lot longer. So, but uh, maybe yeah. it will last a lot longer too. Maybe oh yeah, it a, definitely maybe will. A... Absolutely. So I want to move on to some exciting stuff, but as we do, I just want to I just want to show my Wingard wearable stuff, just so that if if anyone out there doesn't really know what we're talking about, because you haven't seen the last uh, three times he's been with us, uh, I I have your War Club. I love this thing. This is the Thumper, and and it's tested. This is a uh, obliterated a coconut. Hey, a little battle damage, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And I also did the jute wrap there just to. Give oh, you a I little, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little purchase. Um, I have, as I showed you, the quill also with a little bit of jute on there. Just fills it out a little better for my skinny fingers. And then I have the th- uh, three tomahawks that I love: the back ripper, which sits right here on my desk in case anyone, uh, you know, uh, comes in while I'm doing a podcast. I can take care of them. This one is is my dresser tomahawk and then this one is right next to the bed with a bunch of other stuff oh, but this awesome. this is my this is my nighttime disembowelment tool sorry that's a terrible word um, yeah you, yeah you'll patch them up <laughs> you'll call for you'll give them first aid yeah exactly sure. so um i if you hadn't guessed you know i really love these wingard wearables uh um, I, I think they're creative and interesting, but I also just have a real thing for tomahawks. And <clears throat> and you definitely encouraged some of that when talking about um, the the Northeast Woodland period last time we spoke or a couple of times ago. Um, and all of this is very exciting to me, but you have some even more exciting news. And uh, please let us know. Oh, boy. You know, Knife Junkie, Winger Wearables, we've been at what, since 2018? And we got this finally, this new product. It's a knife. Oh, right? yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm not sure because I'm tethered to a very short uh, leash here. Okay. The connection. I'm going to try, I'm going to make noise. And you're going to okay. see my glorious midsection. Okay? All right. <laughs> so don't body okay. shame me. I'm lost. I'm lost. No, oh, here we go. Here we no, go. No oh, body oh, shaming oh. on the Knife Junkie right. podcast. We're all. That's good. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, it is you what? did so this is called uh well we don't have a good name for it yet i want to call this the tusk knife oh, right man. because it's kind of shaped like a, a tusk yeah like i am the walrus right? yeah i don't know <laughs> whoa uh, um and so uh you know the other because a couple of weeks ago you did like a uh a podcast about knives that you wore scouts 
carry yes. across your appendix, right? Yep. So you're wearing them sideways, right? Right. And and I think you said that the minimum length, the maximum length you could wear comfortably was what eight inches? Yes. Yep. Eleven inches. Oh no. That's that's one of the reasons for the curve. Is think you're uh, all right. Everyone who's listening to this, close your eyes and have a mental image of your body. Okay, topless. Your eyes are nipples. Your navel is a nose. The tusk knife is the smiley face. It's worn. We're calling it the tusk knife. Remember, it's yeah. worn like under your your kind of belly area around the waistline, oh, curved God. right. And so that that curve. That curved spine and also the curved rest of the blade follows the contour of your body. So I'm going to put it back in the sheath. Whoa. And you can sit with it all day. And you have to remember that you're wearing it. This is kind of important because you're wearing a big knife, right? And you got, sometimes you got to remember because, uh, you know, big knife is is a big knife and okay, so okay, it okay. the carry system it, so the kydex is also curved right oh my God. and so you got all these eyelets spaced and they're going to be i'm not showing it here but there are two discrete carry concept clips at angles along this and you can change the placements of them it's kind of ranger bands on it. but that's what clips it to your waistline all right and i've worn this just in boxer briefs i've worn this in shorts uh, like swimming trunks. I've worn this in my pants I'm wearing now. Very comfortable because of that curve. Now, we are working with, in collaboration with Tate Buzzard of the Norman Tactical. He's out in oh, Arizona. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so this is a design we've been working with Tate um, over a year. This has been in the works. And so he has, uh, you know, we've got the uh, knife blank swar jet cut, um, but... Um, he is freehand ground uh, these, and so it's got a, these are 3 16 thick blade stock. It's got flat grind, and yeah, it's it's big and curved, and it's got, this is interesting here, a Coke bottle grip Ooh. is what we went with. And so there isn't a choil or a guard, because it really, yeah. you, you might be able to get away with a choil, <laughs> but you, then you thin down the material, which is a stress concentrator. But a, with a guard, I mean, that's going to run into everything here. All right. Yeah. So um, we have been testing this primarily with ergonomics, um, but it's like one of the things that we're doing next that we we did some initial tests with that was encouraging was uh, sort of what I call a grip slip test because we've never done a knife before. Right. Yeah. Like with our tomahawks, when you got tomahawk. Right. I've got a long handle and the sharp I'm gripping it like here. Right. The blade that can cut me is pretty far away. Like with the Empress, the blade actually comes to the handle, right? So you should not choke up on this and, mm -hmm. and hit things with it. But, you know, with the Stingray or with most other Tomahawks, you know, you can choke up with it and you aren't on the blade, right? There isn't really a grip slip self-injury concern, you know, of your hand yeah. sliding up the handle with Tomahawks. But with every knife, and it doesn't matter if it's a folding knife or a knife with a guard or a choil, uh, if you were to forcefully hit something really hard with a point with this hand and your grip is loose, you could slide up and either slam into the guard, which could injure you, or, you know, uh, slide over the choil and then go up the blade. So one of the things that we're doing is testing. We got one of these made... Um, without an edge and with a chisel tip so I could safely stab this into a tree in different stabbing orientations and test like, hey, with that smooth micarta, it feel it looks smooth. It actually has, you know, texture mm -hmm. to it. Um, will my hand slip up on the blade? And this is sort of a test just to see, you know, how safe this design is. And of course, those tests are pertaining to me, my hand. I'm like, you know, not even 40 years old. I got fairly grippy hands you know but testing it with dry grip with wet grip the next test we're going to do we're coating it with uh, mineral oil which simulates you know real either blood or really greasy like i've cut up chicken carbon with this like with mine that i'm wearing now you know i've used this in the kitchen a bunch which is why it's got this sort of like little patina to it but you know if you're like 
one of the things I discovered, you know, using this prototype was the reverse grip is actually really good for like kitchen type cutting tasks. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, your hands get really greasy with a cooked chicken. You don't know if you're carving it up. It's like, it's not that you're then like forcefully stabbing the chicken, right? But I just want to do my due diligence here to test is like, hey, you know, that coat ball shape, it seems to be pretty promising, but are we going to add grooves to it, you know, for yeah. extra texture or not? I don't know. So this is not final, but it's coming out hopefully this year. And it's about 11 inches long with a seven inch blade. And it's uh, 80 CRV2 is what we're starting with. We may go to ABL later, but I'll stop talking. Okay, you got to let me give you some impressions. I'm, I'm really interested and psyched about this because I've been wondering how are you going to make a Wingard wearables knife? And of course, I saw the curve going <clears throat> against the flat of the blade. Um, this makes a lot of sense. And, it and, does. Good. I'm glad and, to and so, and, and I'll tell you why. Because of this recent move to appendix carry, um, I'm very aware of, um, like, like, for instance, uh, here's a knife. This is a great knife. Uh, this is auxiliary manufacturing pocket rocket. This is a great appendix carry because the sheath is relatively shallow. The handle mm -hmm. is relatively small. And so when I'm sitting down, um, you know, it's not interfering with anything. And it's it's like I, I don't even know it's there, even when I'm even when I'm driving. Mm -hmm. And so when I was looking at yours with that curve that very obviously sits right below the male or any anyone's belly but it but you know yes, right there. we we males have that prominent uh belly and it and it it still goes in the same place but it's curving out of the way to be trouble yep <clears throat> that's that's the same thing we did with our micro pikes you know yeah except but, but, this was a thrust centric thing yeah and now yeah. it's got the blade all the way i'll okay i'll shut up no, no no you don't have to shut up but but i was thinking uh the way the the micro pike is the flat is the curved part or mm -hmm. um you know what i'm trying to say yep i was thinking it would be similar with the knife and i've seen that uh but only in art knives for for you know for effect not for usage and i was like how is he going to make that work and i i started going along with that assumption this reminds me of a middle eastern you know, like a kanjar or something and um and uh okay lots of things here um this is begging for a double-edged version or a bayonet oh. version oh double we we want to i'm nervous about that because the tip oh double edge i mean <laughs> i like a strong tip you know and I'm yeah. like if i if i double edge it that's gonna be a weaker tip right i know bayonet grinds can be pretty strong though it doesn't yeah. have to be like a big, like a, a high bevel on it. You know? Exactly, exactly. Uh, the back bevel can be just a steep, tearing, gouging, splitting yeah, kind of edge. Especially if you're doing this edge up type yeah. thing, like the right. Bowie knife. Yes, right. Like this exactly. right now would, would be unpleasant if you hit the tip. That'd be kind of less lethal, Yeah, like raking. But, but yeah, if it had a, a little edge on there. So that may be uh, a Gen 2, maybe. To, but, so, but I really like this, um, the, the curve really, man, I got to say it really makes sense the way it goes under. And then, and then you've got a small handle, which is another thing that's very important for me personally in my, um, daily fixed blade carry. Cause it's always, almost always under a shirt and you've got everything rounded, which is nice because oh, yeah. if it's up against the skin, which frequently it is, you know, you want it to be, um, nice and round this is really so something so the inspiration i had from this there was a political cartoon writ made in 1812 uh so it was in america of american political cartoons if you can imagine political cartoons from like uh that long ago they were of course awful yeah. uh but it was uh it depicted britain basically buying scalps from native americans so it was not the most woke depiction but <laughs> um that political cartoon inspired uh helped inspire partly the stingray tomahawk because mm -hmm. the, the the two native american warriors they showed carried tomahawks that were you could see similarity to this basically mm -hmm. uh, even though it was a, a, a cartoonist in, in 1812's like imagination and then the scalping knives they were that one of them is carrying is super curved and uh, there's another depiction of a scalping where uh, 
a warrior has this in his teeth as he's pulling up a scalp off someone's head. Oh. It's also super curved. Yet, out of probably hundreds of scalping knives that have been found, either in collections or in like sites and stuff, none of them are curved like this. Mm -hmm. um, they were often written in descriptions as curved. And I think that cartoonist was like, oh, they had curved knives and he drew it in his head like this. But they always had straight spines on them. Um, and so, yeah, this, I'm not really sure, like you'd mentioned, uh, what was the type of dagger that this reminded you of? Like Middle Conjure? Can, conjure. I'm going to have to look that up to, to see because I'm also thinking like Jim Baia, if this was double-edged a little bit. Jim um, Baia, yeah, that too. Yeah. Uh, that has a real extreme curve, right? The that Jim is. Baia. But, um, you know, we kind of got, it, that was sort of the spark of imagination that led us down this sort of ergonomics design path. Um, but, you know, now that it's made, it's like, you know, in the kitchen, it does all right. You know, and yeah. then uh, camping task. I'm not the like a a butcher or a you know a big bushcraft guy, but you know what we've been putting it through so far is doing well. And I wouldn't recommend. I absolutely would not throw this knife. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. not for throwing. And I I'm not a fan of batoning. I think uh, you use like something like a dick pick, you know, to baton into something and pry. Like you use yeah. something really stout. I, I look at this as more of a uh, meat processing knife and probably we're going to do more testing with wood, but some wood processing. And one of the things here, we didn't want to just make a big knife for the sake of making a big knife. We wanted that length so that if you're wearing like, I think, a thick leather or other fabric around the tip, you could then use this like a draw knife, oh, neat. right? Pulling the blade towards you or, and we kept the spine at a steep, at a sharp 90 degree edge, use it for scraping out handles, that sort of thing. So we right. wanted that length, not just for length, you know, which is good, you know, in combatives, you know, and also for some practicality purposes, like a big knife can do small knife things. That's why, you know, a kitchen knife, the, the knife you use the most is the big one, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we also wanted to enable some unique bushcraft type tasks. Now, I'm not going to advocate that. I want to do some more testing. But what little testing I've done, like I process tomahawk handles, you know, doing like a, several layers of leather gripping this, you oh, know, yeah. you got to be careful, of course. Um, but I do think there's something to this concept that seems promising. Uh, we've got the first batch, like made air quotes i'm saying made air quotes i gotta do that grip slip test to decide you know if what the final texture is gonna be mm. you know um but we're probably not gonna launch it on the first batch because we got you know i think i think we got like 10 days of storms rolling through the area which isn't uh -huh. ideal for walking around and doing bushcraft stuff and stabbing trees um so we're gonna have to kind of wait for the weather to clear up to do more tests and decide you know what's that final grip scale I'll stop so I was just about to ask you, you got to stop saying that. Everything you're saying is is gold, my man. Uh, but I was going to say, um, what besides the ergonomics that are really helping you out to make this a wearable knife, what were the other uses of the curve? But you, you just enumerated some of them. Um, also, in terms of a weapon, what do you think the benefit of that curve is? Um, so if you... When my granddad was in World War II, he told me how he was taught knife fighting combatives. And, and, you know, they were taught with something that looked a lot like a K-bar. It was point forward and hammer grip, uh, edge uh, up. And so it was a heave, ho, stab, and rip. It was sort of like uh, some historic uh, Mexican knife fighting styles and Bowie knife fighting styles were done that way. And so it, with that curve, when you grip it like this, and the heel of the blade is really in the palm of your hand quite well. Let me see if I can. I'm just I'm making this worse. See, you know, it's like camera yes. left, camera right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm holding because I got to stay in frame here. Right? If I yeah, the, the, I'll lose cordage. Right. But it's really in there well, right? Because it's, it's basically uh, that short handle uh, with the rounded butt is sitting in your palm, in your pinching, in that Coke bottle grip here right? And wrapping, right? Yeah. So you got the point forward. It's actually really uh, aligned well for accurate thrust. And if you choose to do an upward drip, fine. Um, 
and you could use this the the back of the spine for you know sort of hooking type tasks and combatives. But with one simple turn, let me see if I can illustrate this. All right? Look how far that tip moved with one oh, little yeah. motion in the hand. All I did was shifted the angle of my wrist and just turned. And I think I, I'm going to say the wrong number, but I think it moved the tip like 16, 16 or 18 inches. inches. Yeah. And so in combatives, if you're transitioning from far range, like I'm trying to like keep distance to close range, like even grappling range, you're able with that curve, if you could imagine someone in grappling range mm -hmm. right there, we are hugging each other. That curve can definitely go into the back or go, go around yeah. bones and things like that, that you normally can't do with a straight blade knife where you're not be really trying to get the awkward angles to get that in. Um, so that's where I see this in combat is also uh, Michael Janich, you know, he's big into the biomechanical yeah. incapacitation. I do not see, this is not like a spike, like dick pick magnum, you know, if you're going to incapacitate someone fast, you know, put it into the back of their brain, right? Because it's a big rigid spike, it's super stiff. This is meant to seek flesh. This is a single edge knife. You know, I wasn't hating on single edge knives when I talked about them earlier and some of the challenges. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is not a big bellied single edge knife. I don't describe it as big belly. It's quite a pointy tip. It's very curved. Right. But it's quite stabby. And we have tested this on layered fabrics, like uh, I'm not saying Kevlar, but we did like a layered shirting fabric and denim, and it had no problem slashing through it, like slashing oh, yeah, and that. stabbing. And in the slash, it's got big draw cuts. So if you're talking about targeting upper extremities, which, I mean, I'm not going to call that less lethal, but that is a uh, biomechanical incapacitation. Um, I, that's where I see this knife really potentially shining is in, you know, not getting caught up on a bone, but sliding off and using that bone as sort of the cutting board and sliding from one attack, like slipping off the bone to another, that sort yeah. of thing. I see that as really one of the benefits in Kavaz as a slasher, although it can be used in, in the point, but in, you know, bushcraft and fieldcraft and even kitchen and camping tasks, this reverse edge is, is quite good that it really I aligns see, well with a table which is interesting so i'll stop, stop i see that curve um really great for these sort of outside thrusts you know where they're Absolutely. coming they're coming like this or like this or from down below or or over top like the or, kind of yeah, deceptive. transitioning from a, a slash to you know coming in over yep. yeah absolutely because absolutely. it's so uh, it's you know and, and it just sort of follows the natural arc of your of your uh Look at how easily that fits in. And and the handle seems to, like, one thing I really like about uh, this appendix carry is it's keeping me a little bit more honest. When I when I carried my knife over here at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, I could kind of, like, uh, like, avoid feeling my love handle over here. But up front in appendix, you're oh, just yeah. brushing by it all the time. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm like, I, I feel the flap. I, yeah. I got to lose 40 pounds because eventually I got, like, that that north man movie which i never i think i saw it <laughs> yes. and it was super unpleasant but it was like i loved it i got i gotta be my own viking model i got yeah. burst out of the frigid waters dual wielding axes you know nipples out but it's like yeah. i can't do that right now because yeah no one wants to see that dude that's you a know? high bar to set that's it great is movie. it is i gotta lose a lot but you know it's it's really comfortable here yeah and you know your angle may be different and that's why we have so many eyelets, you know, so you yeah. can space that out. And obviously you could pick a wrong angle where you just draw this thing and it cuts your waistband, right? You got to avoid that, yes, right? So you yes. got to pick the right angle that works for you. For me, I think it's like pinned up like here, basically. Um, and then your pant is going over the top. So the, the handle is open. Um, now I like to keep my shirt tucked in, you know, so I can access things more yeah. quickly, but it is very discreet. And it, you just you don't feel it. It's just the wackiest thing. Um, uh, yeah, that can be an issue though. Uh, now that I'm thinking about my double-edged request, if you are drawing a knife like that, like a Pical style knives, if you carry them in your waistband, mm -hmm. you got to be careful uh, about yep. which way you're you're pulling them out. So it's uh, going to be single-edged certainly for the first uh, batch yeah. or cerebral. Uh, I'll have to think about double-edge. Um, 
And I mean, down the road, I mean, we see this super curved shape. Like I'm talking like years down the road, I could see a family of knives based on this. It doesn't have to be shaped like that. It could be a Bowie knife or other thing, but like really curved. And I think we're going to explore that more. Actually, we are exploring that more. I've sketched up some concepts, but it's just going to take so long because this is like over a year we've been working on this. And I have been uh, having nightmares about waking up and some other knife maker coincidentally coming out with something like this because <laughs> it would take so long, you know, and we, yeah. we're still we're talking about it. It's not out yet. You know, it's going to be weeks, maybe months. You know, we don't mm -hmm. even have a name for it. Like I, I type in tusk knife in Google. There's like 14 different knives named tusk. It's not as bad as Googling dick pic. Right. 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 It's not yeah. as problematic as that. You got to be a brave <laughs> man to Google image search dick pic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, Especially you know, tusk knife is like, there's a lot, but it looks like a tusk. You know, it's like all these other knives named tusk don't look like a tusk. You know, this looks like exactly a tusk profile. They don't deserve the moniker. Yeah. It I does. don't know. So we may hold a naming contest or something because it's like, I don't want a name where bunch of people are confused like they hear about a tusk knife they type it in and it's like who knows i don't know but yeah. knife naming is tough and if we do a naming contest it'll you know it's it's been a harder year it's been an expensive year that sewing machine yeah. you know um so we're not going to have a grand prize it'll probably be one of our wonderful t-shirts which are very nice but, um, i was wearing mine earlier today but then it got dirty at work so <laughs> I, I had to like actually shower I showered for you, Bob. Oh, that, I had to, had to put on a, you know. So anyway, we may hold a naming contest and you may win a t-shirt and the t-shirt looks great. It's got a man's hand with a oh, dick yes. pick I going through it. That is a cool t-shirt. bodily fluids. I mean, you got a wholesome t-shirt right there. So, all right, let's let's bring this all back. You you mentioned the dick pic, and that that is a very cool T-shirt. I do need to get myself one, and uh, I know you my could goal. win it if you win the knife, knife <laughs> naming contest. If we do that, um, so I, I want to bring it back uh, full circle to the the Magnum dick pic. Uh, I first of all, thank you so much for showing off the knife here. I think right. maybe for the first, it's time. the exclusive. You guys I, got the exclusive. Uh, I am stoked. Well, I am gonna put... plug the the show when I go on Instagram. When does the show come out? Uh, I believe this will come out on on this coming Sunday, and I will tell you the date after. after okay, so whatever that coming Sunday is, I'll plug it and I'll be like exclusive. If you want to see yeah. what the knife looks like, oh man, people will get, be psyched. And the few people that see our post will will come right to your podcast. Hopefully, we don't so, have that uh, many people that see it. <laughs> anyway, that's another thing. I, I want you to I want you to relate a story you were um, telling me before we started rolling without. You know, without going into whatever detail, but how you actually used this uh, Magnum tool, not for combat, not for anything, but for a very practical uh, use. So, yeah, I basically was having to dig through. Uh, I was using it to probe and bust apart rubberized rubble. It was just a, a bunch of bits of rubber that were condensed. It was a day job related, dirty task. It was just so condensed that you couldn't break it apart, hitting it with a rake, with a shovel, because it was like bits of rubber that were compressed into a big ball. Wow. And so when you hit it with like a mallet or a rake or whatever, it just kind of bounced off because it was it was really dense, but it was also a little give to it. So using that dick pic with two hands, just like this, just like slamming that point in it or you know, striking with two hands and getting that chisel, that pry bar chisel in there and raking um, and prying, you know, I was able to bust chunks off this thing. Um, and so, you know, it was one of those things where you, you use the tool that you had on you um, and it worked. And so, yeah, you know, dick pick magnum, um, also good for trash picking up, you know, yeah, I've done that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it is large. You can with the right pant selection, you can wear it inside uh, the waistband like so above the groin. Obviously, I got a conflict here because I got the tusk knife. Yeah. Um, but it is compatible with those aftermarket carry systems. So you can carry it, but it is a lot. It is big. You know, the dick pick full size is going to be probably the more practical option for vast majority of people. But if you got need big prying tasks, 
you know, big piercing task, big probing task. Yeah. Get the Magnum. Get the Magnum. I need to get my hands on the on the regular full size. I think that's the one that fits my lifestyle currently. That's right. Uh, but we can still talk about the Magnum. Oh, yeah. It's still fun. <laughs> Hammering task. It does work. So you can grip it right on those facets here. And use it for hammering, percussive crying, busted apart pallets with it. It's pretty fun. Zach, always coming up with really cool, creative, useful, and weapony, interesting things. Thank you so much for coming again on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you for having me, Bob. Oh, it's always been great. Always a pleasure. And thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for using this platform to show off your new Tusk. Thank you for knife. giving the platform. It's amazing. I am, I'm totally psyched. All righty, sir. I thank you. Take care. Bye. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables. Um, yep, you saw it here, exclusive. He showed off his knife here. Tusk, we're not sure, we, you know, uh, but uh, it does look like a tusk. And you know what? There are plenty of knives out there. I know there are a couple of knives out there called the Victor. I know there are a couple of knives out there called, uh, well, there are a bunch of knives out there with double names. So if you like tusk, Zach. Hold on to it. Be sure to join us next week for another great interview. And of course, Thursday night knives on Thursday, where we just kick back and chat knives. So your wives, girlfriends, and significant others don't have to hear it. For Jim Morkin is magic behind the switcher. My name is Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.